Hello everyone, welcome to Let's Talk, World Talk Show presented by Clickaway Creators. Today we have Sartak Sarin with us. Sartak Sarin is a partner in Ketan & Co's corporate and commercial practice group. His practice spans a range of areas including mergers and acquisitions, assets and business transfers, and joint venture transactions. And he also regularly acts as a strategic advisor on particularly complex and often market leading control deals, growth capital investments, collaborations, and exits transactions in India. He also specializes in structuring inbound foreign investments and has considerable experience in negotiating high value commercial contracts. Sarthak has also advised Indian and foreign clients on shareholder disputes in, in India. Sarthak has a wide range of industry experience, including print and digital media, FM radio broadcasting, technology, and retail and e-commerce. Hello, Sarthak. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm good too. Thank you for asking. So, uh, Sarthak, uh, before we, uh, you know, before I bombard you with uh, the other questions, uh, please uh, tell us about your journey uh, as a legal professional so far. Uh, first, I'll, I'll start by saying thank you for having me here. Pleasure, and, uh, thank you. Yeah, and thank you for taking the time to do this. Um, so journey as a legal professional. Uh, the journey so far has been great. Uh, after graduating from uh, Symbiosis Law School, uh, Pune in uh, 2010, I started my legal practice as a dispute resolution lawyer. Uh, focusing specifically on corporate and uh, commercial litigation and arbitration. The goal was to gain some basic but first-hand experience of how courts and arbitrations worked, client management, and uh, networking with litigating lawyers. So uh, I did that for around 18, 20 months. Uh, then I moved to the UK in uh, 2011 to pursue my master's uh, in law and finance at the University of Oxford. I came back to India in 2013 and uh, joined uh, Ketan & Co as a fresher in their uh, corporate and m and practice firm. Uh, ever since then, I've been with Ketan and uh, again, uh, a great journey so far. I was promoted to a uh, partnership uh, last year, uh, but uh, yeah, there's still a long way to go, uh, a lot to achieve and contribute. Thank you so much, uh, Sarthak, for throwing light on your journey. Um, now, coming to my favorite question, uh, being a layman, I'm very much interested in knowing about your most memorable case and uh, your key takeaways from there. I'm sure there are a lot of cases that you would want to discuss right now, <laughs> but a uh, few of them, if you would like to uh, enlighten us with. Well, that, that's, that's true, right? Every transaction is uh, special and uh, offers its own unique set of uh, learnings and uh, challenges. Uh, but the most uh, memorable one uh, definitely has to be this transaction uh, that introduced me to this uh, sector that I'm really passionate about, uh, FM radio broadcasting. And this transaction did not just introduce me to this whole new uh, you know, free, the practice, uh, but also helped me build a, build a very strong foundation uh, in this uh, practice area. So uh, shortly after uh, joining Ketan, uh, I was uh, staffed on this uh, matter. It involved a leading uh, print media group uh, in the country, uh, you know, looking to acquire a well-established radio network. Uh, initially, I was just, uh, you know, working on some contractual aspects of the transaction, but I was so intrigued by the whole operations and commercials of a radio company that I forced myself to become a part of the, you know, the diligence team, the transaction team. And, and it was just great. The whole, the whole experience of understanding how a radio company operates, you know, what are the crown jewels of the company? Uh, it was all fascinating and interesting. And uh, since it was my first deal uh, in this uh, sector, I was very curious. I had uh, unlimited questions, never ending questions. And uh, the management teams on both sides of the table were experts uh, in this sector. So there was a lot to observe and a lot to absorb uh, you know, from them. Uh, the learnings specifically, uh, you know, one of the main reasons why this transaction for me has been so memorable has been because 
uh, the learnings and especially the commercial aspects uh, you know which I got to learn from the you know from the management teams on the matter have been unparalleled and in a way have become a benchmark uh, you know for me when I'm uh, doing other deals uh, in this in this sector. Uh, the other one was about the key takeaways, right? Uh, there were many takeaways and uh, most of them, in fact, are the usual ones that you'll uh, find, you know, in any other transaction. For instance, how important it is, uh, even for a transaction lawyer to think commercially and, uh, you know, knowing about the target's business, you know, the client's business, the overall industry uh, in which, you know, the transaction is taking place. Because... This really helps you to provide a robust uh, uh, and you know, commercially sound legal advice uh, to the parties. The other important key takeaway uh, was that uh, as, a, as a transaction lawyer, you know, your role is to get the deal done. And to this end, you have to be amiable, you have to be proactive and collaborative uh, you know, in your approach. In this transaction specifically, uh, given given you know the the big ticket size of the matter, there were many advisors, and uh, early on I realized in the transaction that in order to get you know the deal done in the best interest of my client, I had to be collaborative, I had to be amiable, and that really helped me uh, you know uh, want to build a good uh, uh, you know uh, uh, mileage with all, all the parties involved and, uh, uh, you know, help me achieve, you know, the, the targets that my uh, client had set for the transaction. Um, these were the usual one and you'll find these, you know, takeaways in almost all transactions you're on, but one very specific and, uh, you know, the, the learning that I took away from this particular transaction was that uh, never shy away from doing something new. I was comfortable with what I was doing. I was comfortable with the sectors I was usually advising on. But when this opportunity came, at first I was I was not, not reluctant, but I was double-minded. But then when I dived into it, uh, I discovered something new that really appealed to me. And uh, after the transaction, I found that the experience of doing something new really brings variety uh, you know, to your work profile as well as your uh, skill set. Well, thank you so much for answering that question. And also, uh, when you were talking about the specific key takeaways, actually all of them, uh, you know, uh, kind of, uh, you know, goes with everything that everybody is doing right now. So you have actually told this uh, it, from your perspective and how did you learn all these things. But uh, I was just, you know, listening to you and I realized that it goes with everybody and anybody. That's the best part. Yep, yep. <laughs> All right. So uh, diving right into your specialization, uh, uh, Sarthak, how do you look at uh, corporate and commercial laws in uh, 2021? And how uh, do you think it's going to change five years down the line? <laughs> That's a tough one. Uh, so, so let me, you know, let me start by saying that uh, India, uh, you know, as, as, as a jurisdiction has always been perceived as an over-regulated uh, you know, uh, jurisdiction with a cumbersome business environment and involving laws. But uh, talking about corporate and commercial laws uh, today in particular, I believe they're in a very good shape uh, and to a large extent uh, reflect the intent of the government uh, to improve the ease of doing business in India for both uh, domestic entrepreneurs as well as uh, foreign investors. For instance, uh, you know, the company law uh, now puts greater emphasis on transparency and governance and has in the last few years witnessed considerable deregulation and procedural simplification. Uh, this has in turn eliminated many unnecessary compliance burdens, you know, which uh, uh, the companies uh, uh, were facing in India. And this was really impacting uh, the ease of doing, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, whole, the whole regime uh, for, for, for the government. Uh, another good example that I can think of has, is the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code. Uh, since its introduction uh, a few years back, the new regime has improved the overall recovery rate for creditors. It has reduced the time uh, taken for resolving insolvency, and most importantly, 
it has provided uh, debt-ridden companies an opportunity and uh, various effective tools to restore financial viability wherever possible. From a commercial perspective, I, I, I believe you know, recent amendments to uh, the Specific Relief Act, uh, as well as you know, the Arbitration and Conciliation Act have addressed the concerns around the lack of contract sanctity and forcibility challenges. This issue, the lack of contract sanctity has been one of uh, you know, the grave uh, you know, areas which have been uh, impacting uh, and uh, you know, uh, disturbing uh, uh, foreign investors and uh, domestic parties alike. But now with these amendments, uh, especially the Specific Relief Act, uh, replacing the discretionary powers of the courts with the mandatory specific performance of contracts, uh, designation of uh, special courts, and uh, introduction of timelines for timely disposal of cases has certainly upped investor confidence. And uh, you can see that India's rankings on the global ease of doing business table has improved uh, considerably. Changes that I see Many, many more changes, you know, are in the pipeline. You know, we are we are uh, uh, at a stage. Uh, I I won't just at least I I believe that uh, as a developing economy, laws are evolving, but uh, we are somewhere more advanced than that uh, in terms of where we stand, uh, especially in the commercial and corporate laws. But uh, nevertheless, over next couple of years. Uh, years, one can uh, certainly uh, expect further simplification of uh, administrative procedures through reform across many corporate and commercial laws, uh, further decriminalization of uh, corporate offenses for companies, including uh, decriminalization offenses for LLPs, uh, limited liability partnerships. Some specific examples that I know of, uh, you know, will become effective from uh, the very next financial year itself is, uh, you know, our easing norms for setting up a one person uh, companies in, in India. So the government is looking to remove the unnecessary restrictions around, you know, the turnover requirements, paid up capital uh, for these companies. Uh, so these are small companies, which even, you know, you just need one shareholder uh, to, to uh, incorporate them and operate them. And the government is thinking of allowing even uh, NRIs, non-resident Indians, uh, to directly set up, uh, you know, this vehicle uh, as a choice of uh, business entity in India. Uh, similarly, the government is, uh, I believe, working on a framework to allow certain classes of uh, public companies to list their securities directly in uh, foreign jurisdictions. Um, on, on a related topic, I believe one can uh, expect further rationalization of the securities law including uh, introduction of a unified uh, securities market code, uh, you know, which will lay down the foundation for a more streamlined uh, administrative structure for the securities market and uh, ensure for the alignment uh, between the laws and the current market practices and instruments. Well, thank you uh, yet again, uh, Sarthak. But as we are on that topic right now, which is related to corporate and commercial laws. Um, do you recommend uh, sector specialization for corporate lawyers? And if you think so, that at what stage of the career should a corporate lawyer pick up a sector or a specialization, area specialization? Oh, definitely. Uh, uh, you know, uh, and it's, it's driven by experience. Uh, as you mentioned at the very beginning of the, you know, uh, our discussion, there are certain areas I, I uh, you know, specialize in, including uh, media, broadcasting, e-commerce, uh, retail. And, uh, and, and the reason why I would uh, recommend this uh, specialization for corporate lawyers is, uh, you know, for two uh, significant reasons. One, there's a, you know, there's a very, uh, uh, you know, compelling uh, business case for it. And I'll, I'll explain why. And uh, second is, uh, it's, it's a great marketing strategy uh, on, on, the, on, on you know, the first aspect of a business case. You'll find that many law firms today are carving out a niche for themselves in specific uh, practice areas. And uh, to this end, they have been vigorously promoting their uh, knowledge 
and uh, expertise across uh, several industry sectors. So this in turn has created immense opportunities for transactional lawyers uh, to focus and uh, specialize in specific industry sectors. Uh, uh, and and you know, from as I was mentioning, from a marketing perspective as well, it has a great advantage because uh, being an expert in any uh, specific industry sector means that you become one of the good people uh, for that sector. Uh, first internally, you know, within, within your organization, within your law firm, but then for the market. Uh, at what stage? Uh, so, so focusing and specializing in a sector is an ongoing exercise. Uh, and, and it requires a lot of, uh, you know, time, investment of time, uh, you know, efforts. So I would recommend that one should start as early as possible. Uh, and and see because uh, it's 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 not an easy exercise. It's it's not that you something you know you pick up and and you 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 start liking or you feel passionate about. It. So you have to give it time. And uh, I would suggest that either pick up something that you you know you you really naturally passionate about, or or uh, you uh, you know find yourself driven uh, by or an emerging area that's not too overcrowded. Thank you, Sarthak. So uh, my last question to you, uh, Sarthak, would be that the media sector has of late been witnessing a spate of uh, new legal regulations and regulatory changes. So uh, according to you, what are the key implications of these changes? Well, that's a very good question and, and, a very, uh, and a relevant one. Thank you. So, uh, you know, uh, except for some very general uh, provisions of the Information Technology Act, uh, the, digi the digital media sector in the country had been operating and thriving in a regulatory vacuum. Uh, but since the end of 2019, the sector has indeed been uh, witnessing, as you, as you mentioned, a spate of uh, regulatory and legal changes. Uh, some of the key ones, uh, uh, you know, was uh, the first one is the introduction of the uh, foreign direct investment regime uh, for uh, digital news media, uh, you know, sector that was notified by the government in September 2019. So, so the implication of this is that uh, FDI in uh, digital news aggregation sector uh, has been brought under the government route, uh, and the FDI limit has been capped at 26%. So, what that means is that a foreign investor cannot invest more than 26% of uh, the share capital of a uh, digital news aggregator and such investment uh, requires prior government approval. Uh, the government has recently clarified that uh, you know, existing digital news aggregators uh, which have uh, foreign uh, investment below 26%, they don't need the approval. It's only the ones that who have it in excess of 26% that they need this uh, approval and this approval uh, and the alignment with the new uh, regulation needs to be done uh, before uh, October 2021. Another uh, connected and important change has been the inclusion of uh, you know, digital media companies, uh, OTT platforms, and uh, social media uh, companies uh, you know, uh, within the jurisdiction and control of Ministry of Information and Broadcasting. Uh, earlier, these the, the sector, these companies came under the jurisdiction of Ministry of Electronics and Information and Technology. This change is really significant because earlier, MI, you know, Ministry of uh, uh, Electronics and Information Technology never formulated any rules uh, for regulation of content, uh, you know, on social media networks or or ODD platforms or or the digital news aggregators. But now with MIB being the concerned, uh, uh, you know, the ministry and in wake of the growing concerns around the unfiltered content that's available on, uh, you know, OTD platforms or social media companies. Uh, MIB after taking charge, uh, you know, shortly announced that they would be coming up with a code of conduct, uh, you know, for the players in, in this sector. And they did that last month, in fact, uh, the government came out with the information technology guidelines for intermediaries and uh, digital media ethics code. 
uh, this code is intended to empower the ordinary users of uh, social media and uh, digital platforms to seek their redressal for their grievances, you know, against the content, uh, uh, you know, or the information uh, that's that's available on this uh, medium. Uh, spending, uh, you know, some time on these uh, uh, rules, uh, they have introduced, you know, separate compliance regimes for separate different players in the industry, for instance, for uh, social media networking, uh, you know, sites, uh, as well as uh, uh, messaging services. Uh, there's a there's a compliance heavy model that has been introduced, including the requirement to enable identification of the first originator of the information or the message. Uh, you know, if required by the government or, or a court order. Similarly, for OTT platforms, now there's a requirement that they need to classify their content, uh, you know, films, their, their web series or other shows based on certain parameters such as the age, the theme, uh, you know, the nature of the content, the target audience. Uh, similarly, other interesting uh, aspect that, uh, you know, the rules have brought in is that they have created a level playing field for all across the you know the different mediums in the media sector so now uh, uh, for instance like print media print media is required to you know uh, comply and uh, as well as uh, you know the the tv news broadcasting they are required to comply with certain uh, rules and norms that are prescribed by the press council of india as well as you know the program code which is under the cable television networks regulation act these these norms and you know requirements were not applicable or not complied with by uh, digital media companies but now all these norms and all these requirements are equally applicable uh, to digital media players as well uh, you know to conclude i you know the at least the feedback that i've i've received from many players in the industry after these the you know the rules have come out that Many of them concede uh, to the fact that online content must adhere to some rules or ethics so as to remain unbiased, as well as some filtration is, is justified. However, in the same breath, concerns are also being raised that the government's push for a soft regulatory uh, you know, uh, oversight touch over this sector should not morph into overregulation in time and uh, stifle, uh, you know, the freedom of uh, speech and expression. That's just, uh, you know, synonymous with this uh, medium of, uh, you know, uh, expression. Thank you so much, uh, Sarta, for sharing your experience and more than experience and knowledge with us. Uh, also, uh, it was a lovely conversation where even I got to uh, know a lot of things which I had no idea about. And uh, with, with that being said, we really look forward to having a chat with you again in, in the future on some other trending topics in the international legal industry. And uh, uh, before we end this conversation, would you like to say something uh, to our audience and uh, to, the, to the budding lawyers? Uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, you know, keep your head down uh, and, and, you know, keep marching on. Uh, uh, you know, hard work really pays. Uh, I'm, I'm the first generation lawyer uh, in my family and I was really uh, skeptical when I started the practice. But in time, you know, with hard work, with uh, determination, you, you reach that. And, uh, and, and over time, uh, one thing that's really important is that uh, learn how to balance time, you know, work time and your family time. It's, it's equally important. And, and, and uh, you know, uh, so how, you know, early you realize that, uh, you know, both these aspects need to be given equal importance. Uh, you know, it, it's, 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 it's good. And lastly, do, uh, you know, uh, try to innovate, uh, try to find some areas of laws that you're more passionate about, sectors uh, that you're more passionate about, you know, build a practice, build a brand name for yourself in those sectors. It's, it's a, as I mentioned, it's a great marketing strategy and uh, best of luck. And uh, Bharti, thank you. Thank you for your uh, time again. I look forward to the next talk world conference in April and uh, definitely excited about it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sartak. Uh, again, it, it was a pleasure having you here with us. 
and uh, for our viewers you heard sarthak and if you like this chat uh, with uh, mr sarin please like and share this video and also subscribe to click away creators youtube channel to appreciate what we do and you have more coming from industry legal leaders also please do not forget to press on the bell icon so that you don't have to miss a video from us this is bharti phalex talk signing off take care bye bye